Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Tom. Welcoming you to another study in the Word. I want to thank you for joining me today. We're about ready to in, in, uh, involve you in our second teaching, and it is our second uh, teaching, so you know that, on <clears throat> marriage, divorce, and remarriage. In this particular uh, series of teachings, I want to um, clearly state that it would be very good for somebody to go back and start with number one and go through all of them and not just skip over or just do a number two or three or four because you need to hear the entire thing because I'm really presenting a case from the Bible uh, to overcome many false um, beliefs that have propped up over the years in the church concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So I would really encourage you to uh, listen to it all. Secondarily, uh, if you uh, really uh, enjoy this, this is one of those um, series of teachings that really needs to be shared with the right people. Maybe they went through a divorce, they're hurting, they become remarried, they're confused about what their church has to say about it or the teaching about it. And uh, this will, uh, uh, this teaching will set uh, set people free. Another thing I'd like to mention, and I didn't mention it in the, in the first uh, session, is that I have no bone to pick. Uh, uh, I've been married once. My wife, Stella, and I have been married now for almost 39 years, 38 years. It'll be 39 this, this next year, I think. And so uh, it's not like I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, somehow make a case that, uh, you know, since I had been divorced or whatever, that is okay. Uh, nothing to do with that. I, my particular background, I think, serves us well because I never really, um, I didn't go to uh, any, I'm not in a denomination, not that I feel there's anything completely wrong with any of that, but I'm just saying I'm not in, in a denomination or a certain uh, a fellowship of, of uh, like that. And so uh, I never uh, had to learn their way of thinking about this. So I was able to study it from my, uh, from the Word of God and my own experience uh, and the standpoints of common sense and uh, interpret it in light of that. So that's that's basically uh, where I'm coming from, and I want you to know that. Now, uh, most of the bad, what I would consider bad doctrine and teachings on, uh, on marriage, divorce, and remarriage in the church come from what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. Today I'm going to go ahead and take the uh, New King James Version and read it. Uh, the first session I used the the uh, King James Version, which I normally would use uh, in these particular uh, sessions. But today, I'm going to go ahead and read this out of the New King James Bible, starting at verse 1 through verse 12. Will you join me in reading, please, if you have your Bible? Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these things, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region, region of Judea behind the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Verse 7, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But Jesus said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus uh, from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Now, um, this particular passage of scripture uh, is taken uh, by certain denominations, not looked at with the right biblical interpretation laws, and therefore uh, it, it it really has caused some issues. Now again, I want to go over just briefly with you 
biblical interpretation laws. How do, how do we interpret certain, certain um, uh, passages of Scripture? What, what are the rules that we should go by? And there's others, too. <coughs> Excuse me, but for this particular teaching, I'm just going to go over some. The first one would be, we must strive to keep Scriptures in context. Taking, uh, taking Scriptures out of context will cause you to have some issues. Uh, secondarily, who is doing the speaking? Uh, now, this is important in this particular uh, teaching I'm going to do today. Who's doing the speaking uh, in this section of Scripture that we're talking about? And what are they speaking about? And whom do they are? Who, to whom, excuse me, are they speaking? That will become very important to us. Study helps. Greek, Hebrew, the culture, running everything through Calvary since it's a new covenant that we have, the New Testament of love, comparing Scripture with Scripture along the lines of this particular doctrine that we're trying to come to the conclusion on. So that's uh, that's just a wise biblical interpretation. So here we see that Jesus um, made these comments in Matthew chapter 12, and we know that Jesus, of course, always, when he spoke, was speaking the truth. We also know, though, that there's some maybe some things here that we need to discuss before we talk about who this is applied, who this can be applied to. Now, I, I mentioned Brother Hagin's a book on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, which is, I would highly recommend everybody get a copy of. That's Kenneth E. Hagen. It's really an excellent book. And he has uh, three scenarios that he put down in it that I can't, I can't improve on. So I'm just going to read them to you. The first one we wrote, read in our first uh, uh, series. The second, one, uh, the second situation we're going to read about from his life um, and uh, from what he observed is this, and so I'm going to read through it. it. says this, the wife leaves, okay? Another situation I knew of almost motivated me to study the, uh, also motivated me, excuse me, to study the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. A pastor, a minister of the gospel, was left with five children when his wife ran off with another man. She had done this twice before, and he took her back. I think he did this so just so the kids say, but she finally left and didn't want to come back. So this pastor was left with five children. The oldest child was probably 12 years old, and the youngest one was about 18 months old. As long as he didn't remarry, he would be accepted and could still pastor in his denomination. But a man who is between the ages of 35 and 40 and has five children needs a wife. Those children need a mother. So he remarried. And because he did, he was forced to give up the church that he was pastoring. He was with a full gospel denom denomination, but he had to surrender his certificate of fellowship. He was no longer in fellowship with the other brethren. What could this man do? God had called him to preach. Well, he started having services in the high school auditorium. People started coming, and it wasn't long until he had hundreds of people wasn't long until he had one of the largest churches in the city. Most of the full gospel preachers were criticizing him. They were saying, how can God bless him? He's living in adultery. <laughs> According to their interpretation of Matthew chapter 19 and using what Jesus said here as the, the rules, this man was committing adultery. See? The pastor of the same full gospel denomination said to him, after his wife left for the third time and ran off with this fellow, I went to buy to help him if I could, but his car was in the in the driveway. I knocked on the front door, and no one uh, answered. The children are in school except for the one who was 18 months old. I knew he must be there because the car was sitting in the driveway, so I walked around to the back. I saw him on the back porch with a little one in his arms, and he was just weeping. This pastor said to me I could never criticize him. I knew those children needed a mother. He needed a wife. I don't understand it. I did not necessarily agree with the teaching I, it had, I had received, but I was not going to criticize him. Now, so, you know, here came a conflict in this man's heart about common sense and a doctrine that he had received from his particular denomination on this. Listen carefully because this, this gets interesting. Soon after, we had a full gospel Bible conference. The head man in our state was preaching. In his sermon, he refused, uh, referred to this pastor who had remarried. He didn't call the man's name, but we all know who he was talking about. When this two-day Bible conference was over, some of my church members asked me about it. 
because they had heard others talking about it. So I repeated what the, I heard the man in our state said. <clears throat> the member of my church asked me, well, what do you think about it? I said, I'm a young man. I'm just going to uh, go along with the elders. Then I thought no more about it. That weekend, my father-in-law and mother-in-law came to visit my wife and me. And after the Sunday night service, my wife and two children went home with them. I was going, uh, going up to my in-laws after Wednesday night service. So I was in the Parsons by myself while my wife and two children were at the back uh, my, in my uh, in-law's house. At 10, 15 p.m., I reached up and turned the lights out. Back in the 1940s, the light hung down in the middle of the room, you know, like a cord. Then I knelt by the head of the bed because I was going to uh, going right into bed. Well, it was very dark in the room when I turned the light out. With my eyes wide open, I still was not able to see a thing. So I knelt down and started to pray. I hadn't said but a word or two when the whole room lit up, brighter than it had been when the light was on. He said, goes on and says, I could see every piece of furniture in the room. It was brighter than the noonday sun. The whole room lit up, and I heard a voice say, now listen. Who are thou that criticizes another man's servant? I said, Lord, I, I didn't criticize your servant. The Lord said, didn't you say such and such about the brother? The Lord called him brother. No, I said, I really didn't say anything. Now, I, I was quoting brother so-and-so. I was repeating what he said. Well, the Lord said, when you repeated what he said, that was tantamount to you saying it. In my defense, I said, Lord, you know, I thought he shouldn't be have remarried. The Lord didn't say one word about that. He said again, who art thou to criticize another man's servant? I said, Lord, isn't he wrong? I mean, what, what? That's what the brother is saying, and uh, that's what our church teaches. He said, who art thou to criticize another man's servant? He didn't even answer my question. Then he asked, is he your servant, or is he my servant? <laughs> I answered, if he's anyone's servant, he's your servant. He's definitely not mine. If he is my servant, then who are you to criticize another man's servant? If he's my servant, I'm able to make him stand, and I'm able to make him stand. The Lord was really just... Uh, correcting me based on what the Bible says in Romans 14, 4. I said, forgive me, Lord, I was wrong. Then the light went out. From, this, from that day forward until this, I kept my mouth shut. But that incident started me thinking about the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I began to study the Word of God on the subject a little more. Then I began to ask questions. I asked certain leaders of the denomination what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. They would say, we don't know. I would say, well, we ought to know. I couldn't find a preacher or a minister that could explain 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to me. And I talked to the leading Bible teachers of that day, but none of them could explain it to me. Every one of them wanted to back off and say, I just don't know. I thought, well, why don't we know? So I got into the word again concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I didn't have time just to study this one subject all the time. I had to preach sun uh, sermons Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I had to study in other areas and do other things as well. But in my spare moments, I would study on this subject. Now he's going to talk about the third situation. Okay, So what Brother Hagin is saying, he saw these things. It troubled him, but he was going with what his elders said, what his, his denomination believed. Got him in trouble when he criticized from the pulpit because he used what the denominational leader said about this man. And apparently Jesus didn't like that. Now, here's the third situation. A husband leaves. Then a third incident happened that triggered me to really switch or search out the answer. My only sister's husband left her. Now I had talked to him. I knew, of course, that he was running around with other women, gambling, drinking, and so on. But he had a family to take care of. After he left my sister for another woman, I was preaching in West Texas, and God spoke to me. I drove more than 300 miles there were no freeways in those days, so I drove all night, and then I located him. He was a salesman. As he was coming out of the place of business, I said, Doc, I want to talk to you. I spoke to him very kindly with tears. The Lord sent me down here. He, uh, the Lord sent, sent me down here 
but he spoke to me. He began to cry. He cried more than I did. Tears were running out of his eyes like water running out like a faucet. He said, I believe it. I know, I know you. I followed you for years. I believe what you're saying. I said, the Lord spoke to me and told me to come and talk to you. I talked to him about being saved. He said, you're right. I know you're right, but I'm not going to do it. I said, all right, Doc, let me approach you from another standpoint. If you don't want to become a Christian, if you don't want to serve God, at least make a, cha a change for the sake of your, over your children. Think about your little boys. I came from a broken home. I know the misery. I know what happened to, pe to me. People spit on, kicked us, knocked me around. I was ma mad at the whole world. He said, I know you, you're right, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I said, Doc, if you can't become a Christian, at least for the sake of your children, show some decency and respect, and at least be a decent human being, at least be a man. Don't run around with every woman in the country. He jumped. He jumped like I'd hit him with a whip. He then wept and sobbed, saying, I know you're right. I'm a dog. I'm just a dog, but I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay that way. I, I, I want to stay that way. <clears throat> then I said, I've done my best. I'd done what God told me to do. He went away weeping. I went back to my meetings between 3 and 4 in the, after, in the morning. I was lying on the floor of the church auditorium praying for him. The Spirit of God said, get up from here. I got up and said, why? He said, don't pray for him anymore. Lord, I said, he's lost. He's going to hell. The Lord said, I know it. Well, the, uh, what do you mean, don't pray for him? He's joined to his idols. Did you ever read in the Old uh, Testament where I finally said, leave, leave Ephraim alone? See Hosea 417. I don't, uh, he said, don't ever, don't you ever, the longest day you ever live, pray another, pray for, or another prayer for him because he's going to die and go to hell. How does God know? Well, I believe he knows the future better than we know the past. I understand that that doc, my ex-brother-in-law, died at an early age cursing God. Wow. Now, my sister was left with five children. She had to go to work to make a living for them. Even though Doc was supposed to help her, he never did pay anything to support his own children. I helped them all I could. I did a lot for them until eventually my sister met a gentleman and they got married. Now, according to the teaching of my church, you know, she was not supposed to remarry. The church believed that she was living in adultery. Well, they got married about Christmas time. They came to visit us between Christmas and New Year's Day. They were with us in the services. On the first Sunday of the New Year, I preached. My sister had been in church at one time, but because of all the difficulty she had encountered, she had gotten out of church and wasn't going. She was in a low state of spiritual fellowship. Now, I've only seen this manifestation three times in my 65 years of ministry. About the time I was finishing my ser sermon, suddenly a light flashed. Now the buildings were well lit, but it was just like a giant flashbulb went off and everybody was temporarily blinded. No one could tell what happened because no one could see anything. In other words, it happened just as fast as I could snap my fingers. Suddenly there was four or five people in the altar. How did they get there? We never did figure that out. Hmm. My sister was sitting in the third pew. She wasn't next to the aisle. She was in the middle of the pew. Now, if someone comes out of a pew, they're bound to brush against your knees. You would know if someone came out um, by you. But it happened so fast. And my sister was one of the people who has immediately down at the altar. She had never been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken in other tongues. But when I saw her at the altar, she was speaking in other tongues. Not only did the Lord restore her to fellowship, he also filled her with the Holy Spirit. According to the church, she shouldn't have been able to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. According to the church, the Lord shouldn't baptize her in the Holy Ghost. According to the church, she was living in adultery. This really triggered me to study more on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. My sister came back to the Lord on the first day of 1946. It took me three years to find the answer, but I found it in 1949. So we can see here that during those particular times in Pentecostal cir uh, circles, they were confused. And I would have to say some people are still confused today. But it's not just Pentecostal circles. 
Many times we see these same doctrines in other denominational circles, and still today we see them. Why? Well, because they take the scripture in Matthew uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 12, and they use that for all people. Now, I want to explain this to you so you can understand. It's really very, very simple to understand. What Brother Hagen came to the conclusion of was this. But even if Brother Hagen had not come to the conclusion of it, it's still true. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When interpreting the Bible, you must remember one of our rules of interpretation is who is being spoken to. What's the subject and so on. But who is it? Who's being spoken to? And by that I mean this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if we look down at verse 32, the Bible says, notice this, Give non offense neither to the Jews, neither to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Let me read it again. Give non offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor the church nor to the church of God. Now, from the scripture, we see there are three people groups that God deals with. Three people groups that God dealt with in the word of God. Number one, he dealt with the Jews in the Old Testament, the whole thing. Secondarily, he began to deal with the Gentiles, or he deals with the Gentile world. The Gentile world is the unsaved world, the unsaved people out here that are not Jews. And today we would say that even the unsaved Jews. And then there's a third church. There is the church of God or his body. God does not deal with the Jews the same way he does with the Gentiles in the word of God and the same way he does with the church. The church is separated from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Sometimes in scripture, God will address all three groups. Sometimes he's addressing in a scripture, a certain section of scripture, uh, sometimes uh, the Gentiles only, sometimes only the Jews, and sometimes only the church. Now, the, the Mosaic law was given to the Jews. We know this. Now, so you need to understand that. Um, let me read again. I, I want to read a, a page 21 out of this because he sums it up rather well. But it's important. The Mosaic law was given to the Jews. God gave the Mosaic law about marriage and divorce to the Jews only. The Mosaic law was never supposed to be governed the nations that were formed uh, uh, around them or the Gentiles who lived amongst them. The, Jew, the Mosaic law was for the Jews only, not for the Gentiles. Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 through 4 reads this way. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. Because he has, he has found some uncleanness in her, then let her write her, uh, her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of the house. And when she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and sendeth her out of the house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband was sent away, sent her away, may, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance. So, under the Old Testament, a woman seldom had any voice in the choice of a husband. Her father sold her to the man who desired her. If she pleased a man, he kept her. If not, he had a legal right under the Mosaic Law to return her to her father for the purchase price. Now listen, in Matthew chapter 19, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus expounded the Mosaic Law about marriage and divorce to the Jews. He was speaking to the Jews. He was speaking to the Pharisees. They asked him a question about this. It doesn't have anything to do with the Gentile world. All right. It has nothing to do with the church world. He's speaking simply and directly to the Jews about a question asked from the Mosaic law, 
which we have nothing to do with today. He was given the Gentiles, the law was to govern them. The Gentiles were not under the Mosaic law, then or now. They had never been under it, and Jesus was not giving the body of Christ the law to govern them. Jesus was simply asking the Pharisees question about the Mosaic law. In Matthew chapter 19, we cannot, we cannot, again, use that scripture to define the rules of marriage for anybody but the Jews under the Mosaic law. You can't use it for uh, the, the world today. Out here, the Gentile world that doesn't know God, and you certainly can't use it for the Christians. But yet Christians are trying to use it again. And it was never given to us to use under in the body of Christ. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus answered the Pharisees' question. He made it clear that Moses was specifically referring to fornication or sexual sin. However, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, Paul introduced an exception that Jesus did not mention. Paul said that if an unbelieving spouse decides to leave, the Christian spouse is not under bondage to, to the marriage vows. This is the seeing contradiction between Paul and Jesus that people always talk about. This is what caused so much confusion in the body of Christ. But we must remember that Jesus was interpreting the law of Moses to the Jews. It had nothing to do with the Gentiles. It had nothing to do with the body of Christ. While Paul was showing how the law of love applied to the church in Matthew 19, Jesus specifically answered a question about what the lawful what was lawful according to Moses. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul was answering the question, what would love do? What some have described as a contradiction is not really a contradiction at all. Then Jesus reminded the Pharisees of a better law than that of Moses in Matthew 19, 6. Jesus repeats the statement and commandment that God gave Adam at the beginning. Wherefore, they are uh, no more uh, twain or two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. In old covenant times, it was not uncommon for a man to have a plurality of wives. Which one did, did, uh, did he become one with? You ever thought about that? Man in his fallen state did, have the love, did not have the love of God shed abroad in his heart. So you see, until Jesus came to redeem mankind, no one could fulfill the idea of marriage because man was being dominated by the sin nature, uh, didn't have the life of God. The two born-again believers, full of the love of God, can fulfill Matthew 19, 6 and become one flesh. So this is very interesting, and I agree with the statement. What, what Jesus is trying to explain is uh, to them was simply to answer the question, they were asking him, trying to trap him. But today, we are not under the Mosaic Law. The church certainly is not. It's under the law of love. And when it comes to divorce and remarriage, every situation is different. Let me say it again. When it comes to the, the question of divorce and remarriage, every situation is different. And so we're going to continue to study on this. Unfortunately, in my second session, I've run out of time. If this has been a blessing to you, you're learning anything, please share it. Please subscribe to our videos. And if you will, go to our website, faithalivefellowship.org. There we have a, a whole page of free seminars for you to uh, uh, partake of and, and study. And also, praise God, you can send us uh, any prayer requests you may have. Uh, and... Uh, you know, feel free to go and, and uh, become a partner with us and donate if you wish. We really appreciate all those who are doing that, and many of you are. Well, I'm out of time, but always remember this. Feed your faith, starve your doubts to death. Until next time, God bless you.